I'll do that. I wouldn't say this is my best work when it comes to. I do like the fingerprint over the dude's head. Yeah, that's a good one. Okay. Happy Friday the 13th. Welcome to Backyard Naturalist, spooky edition. Uh, want to say thank you to viewers like you, as always. You're what makes this program possible. And you too can become a subscriber uh, for our Backyard Naturalist series. Your subscription includes weekly lectures, uh, monthly field trip, and our subscriber appreciation party. And we have seasonal and annual subscriptions available on our website. Tim's been plugging a couple of trips. I won't, I won't force the video again, but um, we'll be going to Southern California. I'll be leading Southern California Eco Travel Trip um, at the end of February, beginning of March. Um, so we'll visit LA and the Channel Islands and Santa Barbara and the Santa Monica Mountains and explore um, the urban nature that Southern California has to offer. And then Tim will be going back to the Galapagos uh, April 7th through the 19th. Um, so check out those eco travel trips on our website and hopefully you can join us. But we'll get back to zombies. So the zombie archetype is quite popular. Um, it has a very long cinematic and literary history. Um, from Mary Shelley's Frankenstein to the TV series, The Walking Dead, more recently, humans have held this long fascination with reanimation and the undead. Um, what zombies are, are undead people created usually through reanimation of a corpse. And it comes from Haitian, South African, and Congo folklore. Um, but the term was first first attracted widespread attention within the U.S. during the U.S. occupation of Haiti between 1915 and 1934. Uh, and since then, zombies have often been portrayed as these non-communicative, unemotional, aggressive, um, slow, clumsy um, creatures, and they often appear in a decaying state and the once human behind this zombie creature um, seems more distant and, and completely unreachable. Most modern day zombies um, have been created through infection, as the story goes, usually um, from various real life pathogens rather than um, the magic of necromancy and, and reanimation. And a lot of that comes from inspiration from the natural world. Zombies um, exist in nature in form of behavioral modification as a result of infection with uh, a pathogen. And so that's what we're going to talk about today. Um, I'll talk about fungal, viral, parasitic, and prion pathogens that can cause major behavioral modifications and create real life zombies. We'll start with rabies. Um, it's thought that the zombie myth um, potentially has origins in rabies. Um, it's a very potent symbol of madness and unstoppable plague um, throughout history. And rabies is probably one of the most widely known of behavioral impacting microbes. Rabies is transmitted through contact with an infected individual, typically through a bite or scratch. Um, and it causes encephalitis, which is an inflammation of the brain, which without treatment leads to delirium and coma. Um, and once these symptoms appear, death is inevitable. And the virus can present in furious and dumb forms. Furious being um, what probably most immediately jumps to our minds when thinking of rabies. <clears throat> this is the aggressive foaming at the mouth bitey form of rabies. It's the second stage of disease progression. And this is um, probably where that, that zombie myth um, 
kind of originated in this, this aggressive form. But the virus can also cause damage to motor neurons. Um, and as the disease progresses, they'll move into the dumb form where there's, uh, they'll experience limb paralysis, lethargy, and excessive drooling um, due to paralysis of the facial and the throat muscles. And eventually the paralysis will progress and cause death. And so the connection to movie style zombies is really apparent at this point. Um, the biting, the staggering, the, the foaming at the mouth, they're all very rabies coated. Um, but going beyond rabies, there are even freakier, creepier organisms that can impact the cognition and behavior of their hosts. So let's jump to fungi. Uh, the fungi we're going to talk about today are cordyceps and ophiocordyceps. Um, these are two groups of sac type fungi that include um, about 600 species worldwide. And they're traditionally used in Chinese medicine um, to support kidney function, heart health, energy, um, and anti aging properties. Um, and because of their known energy boosting effects, they're also common in mushroom coffee blends. They're also famously uh, what causes a uh, mass epidemic and zombie apocalypse in the video game turned television series, The Last of Us. And this is because they're parasitoids. They're organisms that live in close association with their host uh, at the host's expense and um, eventually leads to the death of the host. Um, if you look closer here, the cordyceps used in traditional Chinese medicine are actually caterpillars. Um, the fungus parasitizes the larva of ghost moths and produces a fruiting body um, called the stroma, which erupts out of the caterpillar's head and causes death um, and rain spores down on unsuspecting potential hosts. But don't worry, the majority of cordyceps um, while the majority of cordyceps are parasitoids, they are only parasites um, of insects, arthropods, or other fungi. So The Last of Us is kind of kind of a far off um, tale of science fiction. Um, it's unlikely to, to happen in real life. Um, but the fungi, when the fungi attacks the host, the mycelium, will invade and replace the host tissue. Eventually, the fruiting body will grow out of the host's body, um, allowing the spores to infect new hosts. And so one particular fungus, um, Ophiocordyceps, uh, is known as the zombie ant fungus because it will alter the behavior of its ant host. Um, once infected, the fungi invade the ant's musculature and force it to climb high in the jungle canopy. Um, its final act is, uh, the ant's final act is to bite down um, on a piece of vegetation, uh, effectively locking it in place. And then the fungi bursts through the neck of the ant, like here, um, growing the fruiting body that will release spores uh, into the air currents. And because it's high up, um, it's at a really great um, position to expel spores into a wider range and uh, repeat this cycle. And speaking of things bursting from bodies, um, we're going to jump over to worms, nematomorphs specifically. These are um, nematode-like worms. Um, they're actually a, a entirely different um, phylum, but um, they're also known as horsehair worms or Gordian knot worms. Um, and they're, it's a real case of the body snatcher's vibe. Um, the worms grow within the insect until it's basically a worm wearing an insect costume. Um, and then it'll exert its influence on its host's brain. Um, the worm drives the host to water and forces it to drown itself um, so that the adult worm can then emerge from the dead insect and um, go on to live its, its free living aquatic stage. 
Another parasite worm, another worm specifically, the tree toad, is known for um, having some species that are able to modify host behavior. Um, these are flatworms that require multiple secondary hosts to complete their life cycle. And so a nice example um, is this trematode parasite, which has a second intermediate host of a fish. Um, and this intermediate host gets its brain infected. And so it will control the fish's behavior. The parasite's next host is a bird. Um, so what it wants is it wants the fish to get eaten, um, to complete this life cycle. Um, and so the infection within the fish's brain uh, causes it to display some interesting behaviors um, that are intended to attract predators. Um, so infected fish will swim near the surface of the water and they'll flash their bellies, uh, which like a lot of fish um, are lighter than their um, top. So um, it's very effective at attracting birds um, and so effective that scientists have found that 30, 30 times fish are infected fish are 30 times more likely to get eaten by their un, than their uninfected counterparts because of this change in behavior. Similarly, another trematode species that uses a snail as an intermediate host uses behavioral modification to increase the likelihood that the snail will be eaten by its final host, also a bird. And so uns unsuspecting snails will consume infected bird droppings, um, and then the parasite will develop in the gastrointestinal tract of the snail. And the next infective stage will then travel to the eye stalks of the snail um, which causes an exaggerated inflammation of their eye stalks that resemble a caterpillar. And so it also induces a behavioral change. And so the snail is forced to move to more exposed places uh, rather than hiding away in protected areas away from predators. And then this movement that you can see in this gif um, of the eye stalks also attract attention of a bird. And so the bird will come along and eat either the entire snail um, or pluck off its eyes um, and the parasite lives on. Another famous example of parasite-induced behavioral modification is toxoplasma. Um, while this is not a worm, it is a protozoan parasite that also uses a complex life cycle um, where multiple hosts are necessary in order for it to complete um, its development. And so with toxoplasmosis, cats are the final host and one of the only hosts for this parasite. Um, and ideally an infected rodent would be the one to pass it on to them. And so to increase the likelihood of the mouse or rat getting eaten, um, toxoplasma will infect the brain of the rodent, which causes it to disrupt brain cell communication um, with the amygdala, which is the area of the brain that's responsible for fear. And so many mice that are infected with this parasite um, show a lot of boldness and uh, will approach cats um, without any fear and subsequently be eaten. Um, humans and other animals can also be infected. Um, but the question is, does it cause these dramatic behavioral changes? And the answer is maybe. Um, it seems that in some cases, scientists have found correlations between toxoplasma infections and self-directed self violence. Um, there also seems to be a correlation between um, people who have an infected status and people who are businessmen, um, which likely causes a lack of fear of failure, um, which is why they decided to pursue business. Um, but it's also linked to a range of mental health disorders, including schizophrenia, OCD, and bipolar disorders, um, in some cases, particularly in people with no history of mental illness. But the scariest of all these zombie producing organisms are probably prions. Um, prions are proteins that are very unique in their ability to reproduce on their own and become infectious. 
Um, they do this through abnormal folding of regular cellular proteins known as prion proteins. And these are naturally um, and abundantly found in the brain um, and central nervous system. The abnormal folding of these proteins leads to brain damage and produces rare and progressive neurodegenerate disorders known as spongiform encephalopathy. Um, and they affect both humans and animals. They are rapidly progressive um, and always fatal. And what's super scary about them is you can't, you can't kill what's not alive. Um, so they, it's very hard to destroy them. Uh, most of our standard disinfecting methods like alcohol boiling or even radiation uh, have not been found to kill them. And they persist in the environment for a very, very long time. And probably one of the most well-known prion diseases is mad cow disease. Um, this occurs when cattle are fed meat and bone meal, usually containing the remains of um, cattle or sheep that had a um, spongiform disease, prion disease. Um, and this results in behavioral changes, including aggression, anxiety, um, nervousness, and frenzy. Um, and the animal will also experience a loss of muscle control. And when prions are spread to humans, it is believed when specifically um, mad cow disease is spread to humans, it's believed to result in um, variant Hertzfeldt Jakob disease, which is um, another TSE that impacts humans specifically. Uh, the variant vort version is likely caused by mad cow disease, but there can be non-variant versions of CJD, which are likely due to mutation of the genes responsible for um, coding prion proteins, um, which is either inherited genetically or can be acquired simply by the, the effects of aging on cellular machinery. Um, in most cases, it is acquired and spontaneous. Um, but similarly to mad cow disease, behavioral changes and loss of muscle control are very common. Um, Though the first symptom of CJD is a rapidly progressive dementia, which leads to memory loss, personality changes, and hallucinations. And so another really well-known prion disease um, is chronic wasting disease, which is also known as the zombie deer disease. This disease infects um, deer, elk, and moose and is of major concern in um, in North America, specifically in, in the West. Um, infecting Infected animals first experience a difficulty with movement um, and extreme weight, weight loss, hence the, the wasting disease um, element of this. And behavioral changes are also common, including decreased interactions with other animals, um, listlessness, tremors, uh, repetitive walking behaviors, um, and currently it's not known to defect, de infect domestic livestock or humans, but, um, but commonly it's contracted environmentally um, as many prion diseases can persist for years in the environment. Um, and again, it's very difficult to, to get rid of them. And so while you won't find the undead, per se, walking out and about um, neurobehavioral inducing pathogens, like these ones that we've discussed today, are very real and mimic some of the, those key zombie traits um, that are often portrayed in literature or um, television or cinema. Um, so there's no guarantee that you'll never encounter a zombie. Um, so make sure you're careful out there on this Friday the 14th. And with that, I'll take questions.